Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is KSU fan and Drew Galloway. We are back with the Sunday show with just 20 days until the season kicks off. So, time to get back in the flow of things, start previewing what will be coming your way this year with K State football. And the best way to start today is by kind of playing off of uh, one of the things that was posted by on three the other day. And it was showing, you know, the the 10 most influential players in terms of uh, who will determine who wins a national title in college football this year or something along those lines. And uh, the number one person on that list was Will Howard, uh, interestingly enough. And that obviously caused a stir for how some people uh, wanted to to respond to it and and made it kind of interesting. And it got me thinking in terms of K-State and what the goal is here, who are going to be their 10 most important players this upcoming season, where basically the definition of that would come down to which 10 guys are going to have the most impact on them winning the Big 12. Because as we kind of know, yes, there would be bigger goals in terms of where K-State is at this year. But to get to those, winning the Big 12 puts you in the best position because more likely than not, it will give you a first-round bye uh, in the college football playoff setup unless you know some crazy thing happened and uh, the Big 12 has just cannibalized itself and they're like the sixth highest-ranked conference champion. Seems very, very unlikely. So uh, w- before we fully get into all of that and uh, how we ended up making our lists, uh, because there's a lot of consensus, but there's also uh, some some discrepancies and probably some guys that others ha- didn't think of or have reasons to say, ah, I don't think they should be considered for this list. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask both of you uh, for the final word on what you thought of Will Howard's comments, because the two of you are both a little bit more level-headed than most people that I know that wanted to comment on this situation and DY and I talked about it earlier this week, but uh, I want to, I want to get a check of you guys in terms of the hero and superhuman comments that he made. So drew, I will let you go first. Yeah. I, I just never once thought that Will Howard was ever asked to be a superhuman or superhero. Like you, you could argue that sometimes he thought that he needed to do that. And that led to a lot of mistakes. And we saw that a lot of last season. And a superhero doesn't slide five feet or five yards short of the first down line on a big drive in a tie game against Missouri either. Uh, So I I think that I I take offense to that. And I also just, I take offense to some of the shade that he's thrown inadvertently, advertently kind of at the, the talent level and think that it's kind of a bizarre thing to do when his younger brother is literally on the team. So that, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to um, how people see things is not always reality. Um, and I think um, I think Will, because of some of the things that happened early in his career at K-State and then even uh, in the Big 12 championship year, not starting as a starter, I think there was a, a chip on his shoulder throughout his last couple of years that sometimes came out with the media. And I think that came out even more so um, in that interview at, at, with the Ohio State uh, media people. I, I think he, I think whether it was true or not from our staff, he definitely seemed to have the impression that he had to be a hero. And I, I think Drew's right. I think he sometimes played like it last year more so than he did in 2022. And maybe in 2022, maybe he just got away with it more because he had better receivers and better talent around him. Um, with Deuce Vaughn as well. So, uh, so he had, he definitely had that impression, but we saw, you know, you guys have talked about it. You and Derek talked about it. The games where he tried to be a hero were some of his worst games. Oklahoma State comes to mind. First half of Texas comes to mind. Um, so um, I, I get why people got upset. I also, you know, I, I still um, think Will Howard did a good job in his K-State career here, and I think he did get – He does get some slack maybe from people that maybe he doesn't deserve, but that doesn't excuse him downgrading the talent on this roster. Um, And especially like Drew said, with his brother still here and a lot of guys that he knows, he's got to know and are still friends with. So I, I, 
some of it is the heat of the moment. These are, these are even though he's old, he's still a, a, in college and speaking to the media. And sometimes I think those guys, even when they've been around the media for a long time, still probably say things they probably didn't quite mean, but it comes out and after the fact, you can't change it. Yeah, and I mean, some guys just, one, are never going to be comfortable in, in those settings no matter how many times they're exposed to it. And, uh, I mean, you think about it, Will Howard is kind of in the same situation this year at Ohio State that he was at K-State all of those years except for last year where you're essentially looking over your shoulder at every turn because it, this may not be your job for very long. Now, it's a, a different set of circumstances, but it is the same kind of thing. And I talked about it after I think it was the TCU game last year um, where – Maybe or maybe it was in between the Tech and TCU game, but either way, it was when both Avery and Will went to one of the the midweek media availabilities, and you could just tell by the way and the things that that Will said, like he was not cool with how the situation was playing out right there. He did not like, uh, you know, even if I, I think he could personally be kind and supportive of Avery Johnson. But at the end of the day, I don't think he was pleased with how it was playing out in terms of how the coaches were doing things. And then obviously just being in that position would be frustrating. Like I, I can do plenty of things in life and I can be really upset about it. It's not that I'm upset at any anybody else, but I'm upset at the situation, even if I've caused the situation myself. It's just a matter of then how you handle it. Uh, and at times, I, I think that it showed that, that Will didn't always handle it the best um and and probably just because he had to be on the offensive so many times like when you start off the way you did 18 years old true freshman and everybody is pointing at you like you're 2015 Joe Hubner you're the reason for our problems when it's an unfair situation that you've been put in to be leading this team so i think that's kind of where a lot of it stems from but it'll be fascinating to follow this year uh, and I, I think that uh, this, the people have chosen their sides in this saga, as we've seen on KSO uh, throughout this week in the last however many months, that if you're a Will can do and say whatever he wants person, you're all mean, okay, that's your side. Or if you're a, uh, I've never been a Will guy. Will has always been this. You're probably also the ones that didn't like Skylar Thompson either. So uh, we'll we'll <laughs> roll on and get into the, to the main show of today, which is talking about the 10 most important players for K-State in 2024, the guys that will determine and influence their success in trying to win a Big 12 title in which they are the second favorite team to get that done this year. They have a schedule in front of them that is easier than some others in the league. And when you look around, we think that there's a lot of individual talent that can project out. So uh, I'll start with Drew again on this one. Who were the guys that were no brainers for you that had to be on this list? Uh, the the no brainers for me, uh, I mean, obviously it, it started with Avery Johnson was the where the list started. I had that written down uh, before uh, because I asked if he wanted this in order or not because you know he always got to clarify. Yeah. So I, I had <laughs> I had Avery Johnson written down before anybody else. Uh, then another no-brainer for me was Keegan Johnson, uh, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit later on. And then Dylan Edwards was the other one that was a no-brainer, but just trying to figure out like where he would rank on the list of importance, but knew that he had to be in the top 10 as well. Uh, fan, same question for you. Which guys were no-brainers on your list? I'd go with Avery. I agree with that 100%. I think you know, we'll talk about it, but he's, I think, definitely the key for the offense, especially um, defensively. And then uh, probably DJ Giddens, just because I think we got to be able to run the ball. Kleiman wants to be a running guy. I think Connor Riley wants to be a running team. Um, and then Keegan Johnson as well, just because, you know, the kind of hype he's been getting early, early in the fall. But um, I think he's a guy, you know, you have Jace Brown coming back as your leader, but I think Keegan Johnson is the guy that could be, uh, the key. And then defensively, uh, it's a little more toss up on the defensive side. Uh, but I, I said Austin Moore and Marquis Siegel, um, probably up there, Desmond Purnell. Um, you, I mean, like I said, you can go back and forth. I think there's so many guys. I mean, you guys were both on 
with uh, with with Scott on the the Bosco's boys, choosing your defensive MVP was much much harder than choosing the offensive yes. MVP, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. The defense. Even, even, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say even even doing this list because I I wanted to make it five offense, five defense. I'm trying to come up with just five on defense. I thought was a lot tougher than coming up with a five for offense. The way that I, I ended up kind of approaching it is there were some guys that I just like, I don't know how influential they actually have to be because I think either there are options behind them that are just as solid or close to that level uh, or like the collection will kind of help them not be as important. So like in, in my eyes, Avery and Keegan Johnson were no brainers that had to be on this list. Keegan probably more so just because of how much the coaches have talked him up and everybody's talked him up this off season. You feel like, okay, they must be planning on him being really good for them. And if he can live up to that, then that, that takes K state's receivers to a different level than what the expectation might be. Then the other no brainer for me was there have to be some offensive linemen on here but it was a matter of determining which ones were the most important. Now, conversely from, okay, this guy's got to be on this list. Any surprises for you guys that when you got to the end, you said, oh, I didn't even consider putting this guy on my list because I will start and DJ Giddens was never once considered for being on my list. And I only say that, I'm not saying that fan is wrong here, but I only say that because at the end of the day, you have Dylan Edwards on the roster, and on the flip side, you know you you have DJ Giddens on the roster. If you're talking about Dylan Edwards, but you have D, you have Dylan Edwards there, and I think there's just enough other things to where I don't know that I mean DJ Giddens is going to be really good for K State this year, and he is very impactful to what they do. But you don't necessarily need him to go out there and be another. 1200 yard guy again this year like last year it will be really really nice but dj giddens could run for 900 yards this year and i think k-state could still do everything they need to do like i i think every he's also at a standard that's much higher than these guys a lot of these guys it's a pretty wide range between what you could get good or bad out of them yeah that that's exactly how i did it's like dj giddens wasn't really considered for me either for that same reason and I, I think that DJ Giddens is going to have a really, really good year. But for me on how I made some of my list was kind of like the unknowns of, okay, if this player is really, really good, I think that the ceiling is raised more. And that's why I think that Dylan Edwards needed to be on this list over DJ Giddens because Dylan Edwards can score on every play. DJ can, pro can probably do the same thing, but Dylan Edwards can literally score on every play. Yeah, I, I I can see that take. I I guess my approach was kind of the other way. If if DJ Giddens does not have a good season, that's probably not good for K State because I I think Dylan Edwards is really good, but I don't think he's going to fill quite the bruiser uh, carry the ball twenty times in a game kind of back. So that's kind of the way I looked at it. My my take on your question, Mason, was was going back and forth on which corner to pick. Yeah, because I think the corners are yeah. crucial, but they're both between Parrish and Garber. They're both pretty even, you know, and and how they're being talked up is maybe not only all Big Twelve but all American caliber um, so far uh, by by climbing in in the in the media so far. Um, my my that was the toughest. Which one to leave off because they're both really good players in both keys, and that was kind of my to answer your question. That would be the one I had. All right, let's dive into it. Uh, Drew, I feel like I always make you go second, so today I'm just letting you go first on everything. Uh, <laughs> you can let the people know about your list first. So what uh, what are your comments on the 10 guys that you put on here? Uh, some of these guys you probably don't have to defend very hard for being on this list. Others, there are probably some eyebrows going, who is that guy or what does that guy need to do? Uh, yeah, so for... Avery, I feel like I don't really need to explain. Quarterback, most important position on the field. He is the quarterback. That that That's it. Uh, with Keegan Johnson, it's all about if they can unlock the passing game more, 
I, I think that it's going to be Keegan Johnson that helps unlock it. I said it on Bosco's boys, but my offensive MVP this season was uh, Keegan Johnson is who I ended up picking uh, because I think that they need that valuable receiving option at, at the actual receiver position and not at running back or tight end. Uh, Easton Kilty at three was kind of a combination of not really knowing what they have with Easton Kilty just from playing at North Dakota, uh, but also playing left tackle and being the most important position on the field. Like I think that Kilty will be good if he is like that, like all big 12 left tackle caliber. I think that means that the offensive line was good, which in turn means that the whole offense was probably pretty good. Uh, Marquis Siegel, uh, number four, uh, because if he can finish plays this season, he could give K State some extra possessions and give K State the ball in good field position or take it back to the house because he dropped a few pick sixes. Uh, Jacob Parrish, kind of the same way. Like Jacob Parrish and Marquis Siegel last year, not that dissimilar. Both were really good in coverage, but struggled at times to finish plays after Jacob Parrish takes that next step. And he's already done half of it with the weight, where I, I think that if he can really take that and unlock that and be an all big 12 kind of corner. I think that that means that K-State's defense probably pretty good. Uh, Dylan Edwards, I hit on with uh, the home run hitter aspect. They, they brought him in to be the guy to like score a 50 yard touchdown. And if he can do that a handful of times this year, I think that that's extremely valuable. Uh, Desmond Purnell is like the one guy on here that I have. That's like an established guy. Uh, but I think that he can really unlock that next level and be an All-Big 12 guy. I think that it's D.Y. that's already projected him as a first-team All-Big 12 player. So I, I think that he can do that. Chidi OBI is where I talked about with you guys. If I struggled to pick a defensive end because you had to have one on the list. Uh, but I think that if OBI is good, it probably unlocks a little bit more for the rest of the, the defense and the defensive ends. Uh, because they don't really have one that looks like him at that 6'6", like 270, 280 range, and think that he can really be a disruptor and help open up other guys. Uh, Carver Willis, because if you can lock down both tackles, which is why I have both of them on the list, then I, I trust everybody on the interior. It's If you can get the tackles and especially be good in pass protection, I, I think that that's a really important thing. And then the sleeper on here, if you would have asked me this list, five days ago maybe a little bit longer but within the last week or so i probably would have had alec marenko somewhere on this list but with alec marenko being a little bit dinged up and austin romaine kind of being the name that keeps popping up as one of the best defensive players in the portal or not in the portal just on the team so far you're gonna scare people um <laughs> yeah you know we're used to talking about the portal at this time <laughs> it just feels like it it just rolls uh, but being one of the best defensive players on the team so far during training camp, I, I think that if he can even take just a, a freshman to sophomore leap, I think that that really unlocks uh, the rest of the linebacker room and will make it a lot easier because he he was good at times last year, but also hit a little bit of the freshman wall, had a little bit of an injury. But if he can be that starting Mike linebacker and be a really productive player, I think that that really means good things for K-State's defense. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I don't disagree with any of those. And I, I think even some of the guys on here that I don't have, the logic uh, is probably still along the same lines of of what I had. Uh, before we, we talk about it in, in a, a kind of a grander way and we make points and notes about everybody else's, we'll just go through everybody's list. So, uh, Fan, I will give you your chance here now to uh, explain your selections. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, Avery Johnson kind of agree with Drew. It's kind of self-explanatory with the, the importance of the quarterback. I think the quarterback most of the time in college football is the, the tide that is going to go up or down and, and raise the level of your team. And if, if your quarterback is not a high level player, um, then it limits what you can do as a team, especially in, in kind of this, power four college football playoff era. I mean, if you can get and stack your roster with four and five star talent, maybe not so much, but I think at K-State, it's always going to be uh, a teams led by your quarterback. And we've seen that through K-State's history. Our best teams have been high level quarterback driven. And I think Avery Johnson's that guy. Um, 
you know, he, it's still a little bit up in the air. He really only started one game at quarterback last year, and that was the bull game. Uh, he did account for 12 touchdowns, which was third on the team last year, uh, behind only Howard and, and Giddens. Uh, so he's proven some things and not some others. So I do think there's still a lot to prove for Avery Johnson as well. And, and can he do it for 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 or 16 games or however many we end up playing? So uh, that's why I put him first. Now, <clears throat> some of these I took – I think we talked about Giddens a little bit. My second pick, Austin Moore, is kind of the same. My philosophy is if your best returning players don't raise it up a level, then you might be in trouble. I took that kind of route with Giddens, and I think that I take that route with Austin Moore. He's the only guy we returned that was not just honorable mention all Big 12. He's a second teamer, um, led the team in tackles, led the team in tackles for loss the last and has over 22 or almost 26 the last two seasons. I also think he's most likely to be the green dot guy on defense. So he's going to be with the guy with the calm, which means he's going to be on the field a ton because I, I don't think you want to take the green dot guy off the field very often. So uh, I think that's another reason I have him up there just because he's going to be that leader that Klanderman is going to rely on on the field, in my opinion, I think most likely. Um, my third guy is Marcus Siegel. I think the safety position in this defense is key. I think he's a key guy back there. He he tied Austin Moore last year, leading the team with 63 tackles. Also had nine presses broken up, although you could argue, argue he only had those because he couldn't intercept balls half the time. <laughs> and yeah. he probably should have led the league in interceptions. Uh, but he's, he's a key in that back end. We talked about DJ. I agree with you, Mason. I don't necessarily think he needs 1,500 total yards this year to be as key just because of the other talent, hopefully around him but I still think he needs to be one of the best running backs in the league and, and live up to at least honorable mention all Big 12 status because there's a ton of good backs in this league. We'll probably talk about that. Uh, I My defensive end, I kind of went with experience again. Brendan Mott has been around, has 11 and a half tackles for loss and seven sacks the last two seasons a lot because they rotate guys so often. But he may be the guy that's on the field uh, the most at that spot just because he's been here, done that, as long as he stays healthy. I agree with Drew on Keegan Johnson. Um, and the other thing about Keegan is is his MO at Iowa when he was really good his freshman year was being an explosive play guy and averaging nearly 20 yards a catch. I don't think he needs to do that, but he can't be at, what, like 10 or 8 or 9 or whatever he was yeah. last year. He needs to be a much more explosive player, be healthy, and, and be a six, 700-yard receiving threat, not 250 or 225, whatever he had last year. Uh, I, Desmond Purnell, again, I he's a guy that can be a playmaker at linebacker. I don't think Austin Moore is that kind of guy, even though he's a tackle for loss guy. But Desmond Purnell is established as a really good linebacker and helps kind of clean up that middle of the defense. Uh, the, the corner I went with was Jacob Parrish, simply because he's played corner longer. Uh, he led the team with interceptions last year with four, nine passes broken up. So I think – Keenan Garber, Garber is really, really good, but I think Parrish maybe gets the edge a little bit. Uh, I had Des, De, Dylan Edwards as ninth just because I agree with Drew. Is He's the guy that everybody talks up as a home run threat. And K-State was worse than 100 last year in explosiveness. They need to improve that number to be a better offense. Um, I, I would take being more explosive and maybe less consistent in things like success rate. Um, because I think that explosiveness is what makes a dynamic offense. And then it was hard to pick. I, I agreed I wanted an offensive lineman. I went with Hadley Panzer just because, number one, he's a 26-game starter over the last two seasons. I think he's the most likely to replace Cooper Beebe as the kind of stalwart leader, maybe all Big 12-type player on this offensive line, though I, I agree with the case for Carver Willis and even Kelty as the newcomer. Uh, but I went with Panzer just because of the experience level and and the ability to maybe be that BB type. You're going to pull him a bunch uh, just like you did with Cooper BB, and he's going to be involved on the edge a lot and and hopefully making great things happen and leading that offensive line. I, uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about any of that. I think you're you're on a on a good roll there. All right. Uh, here is, and, and here is my – oh, go ahead. 
unless you pick people that like aren't gonna play, like there <laughs> there is not a bad and there's not a bad. Yeah, I, I did. I mean, transparently, I did send him a message when his initial list had Sterling Lockett at number two. I was like, <laughs> ah, I mean, hey. you might want to back off that one. How many wins does K-State have with a locket starting a wide receiver? You got to think about a lot, that. A lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. I mean, yeah, well, that would be uh, – I'm trying to do the math. I did right a graphic now. on it a couple years ago when Tyler was a senior. It yeah, a well, I mean, that would be – Tyler himself would account for like almost 40. Uh, yeah. So probably 39 is the official total there because, what, it was 10, 11. And then I guess they, they won nine and 23. 13. Yeah, that's probably right. That's probably, yeah, probably tw- uh, maybe my math is a little wrong there. A little short of that, but whatever. Uh, all right. Uh, here is my list and Avery Johnson's number one. I, for me, it's not just that, hey, he's the quarterback. We It's kind of unknown and everything. It's just a lot more about the what he actually could be in terms of like he's got the star power. He's got the talent. If it really all comes together. This isn't just having a really good quarterback. It's a guy that his performance can drag you to higher levels than what you've maybe earned or deserved because of other areas. And then you combine that with what you think K-State might have on this team this year. He's just he's clearly the most important guy because he he really could be the best player that's ever played at K-State. Like that's a a realistic thing that could happen. I have Keegan Johnson number two on my list uh, solely because of, of how much he's been talked about this off season. And if he can play at the level that he's been talked up to be uh, or even close to it, he's going to put the K state receivers in a realm that probably didn't seem attainable going into this season a couple months ago, where he just kind of thought, yeah, that might be the weak spot. They'll all be pretty solid. But you have some guys in there where you think, okay, you can actually make bigger plays in the passing game. And the coaching staff's been very transparent that they want to elevate themselves in the passing game this year. They view that as important to what they get done. So I have him number two. Marquis Siegel's number three for me. I think he's probably the defensive player that has the greatest chance of impacting a game for K-State every single week because of what we've all talked about and what we all know, he was so close to making these massive plays all throughout last season. And he had just one little thing that he needed to do in each instance. And it was catch the football. And I, I, I pointed out, I don't know if it was earlier this week with, with D Y or if I was talking to, to Scott about it, but like after the Oklahoma state game last year, where, where Will Howard threw three interceptions and the K state offense was not very good in the defense basically almost every time down the field held Oklahoma state to a field goal. Chris Kleiman didn't come in there while it did seem like he was maybe a little perturbed about the quarterback situation. The very first thing he pointed out was we did not force any turnovers. And you also think about the fact that Alan Bowman was the most turnover prone quarterback last year in the big 12. He loves to give the ball away with interceptions. K state, not turning the ball over, defensively last year was a big problem. Marquis Siegel could affect that and change that. And he could also do it to where you're not just, oh, we took the ball away. We're on our own 30 yard line now. It could be, oh, we took the ball away and we just got six points instantly. So I think that's why Siegel has to be up there. Des Purnell is right there behind it because I think when you look at most of these talented K-State teams that have reached you know strong heights, they've had really, really good linebacker play. And Des Purnell is the guy where a fan had Austin Moore on there. Totally agree. Austin Moore is really, really strong in what he does for K-State, and they need him. But Des Purnell has probably that next gear that he can get to where he is a real impactful guy, like you talk about. Maybe he could be a a first-team Big 12 guy this year. Uh, When it gets to offensive linemen, Easton Kilty is the first one I put on here solely because, hey, he's going to probably be the left tackle. That's incredibly important. And you're he's making the jump from the FCS to the Big 12. And so we're going to kind of see, is he the real deal? And in addition to that, like, how can he match up and handle the competition around him, which we know K-State 
has a lot of. Um, Jacob Parrish, also on my list, number six at the corner spot. That's just another one where when you're deciding amongst a couple of guys at one position, I'm taking the guy that I feel like probably has another step that he can get to. Like I, I think Keenan Garber is probably in the process of making his final step of what he can be. I think Jacob Parrish, there could be there could be growth within this season for Jacob Parrish, and he probably has the highest upside of those two, or at least you could project it. Jace Brown's number seven. I think he becomes incredibly important because I kind of wrestled with who is going to be the the last pass catcher essentially that I put on here. I thought about Garrett Oakley uh, just because you know the last two years you see Ben Sennett was such an important thing for these quarterbacks to feel comfortable and feel safe in getting the ball to. I think for Avery Johnson, I think that's Jace Brown. Like I, these two obviously have a really strong connection. Jace Brown was probably the most explosive receiver last year for K-State, and he did all that as a true freshman that halfway through the year wasn't really playing all that much. And so if he can make up that much ground in that short of time last year, I'm interested to see what he looks like with a full offseason and then heading into his sophomore year and having a quarterback that's going to be a lot more in sync with him now because his quarterback last year apparently didn't think he was very good. I think the quarterback this year thinks that Jace Brown is a good football player and can go make plays for him. And we saw it in the Pop-Tarts Bowl. I mean, that touchdown throw that Avery made to Jace Brown to basically seal the game, like that takes belief between those two guys right there and going and being able to make plays together. And we already know that Avery and Jace Brown can make plays because the other piece of evidence that I would submit here is the first time we saw Jace Brown doing doing anything last year was – He caught, what, a ball or two in the Texas Tech game that was pretty influential in K-State, you know, lengthening themselves out with the lead. So I think Avery Johnson and Jace Brown have that connection. Um, I think, think, you know, Jace Brown's probably going into the year as maybe the number two officially on the depth chart, but I I think he's going to be K-State's best receiver this year. Now, my next one, this is my defensive end submission because when we're talking about Hey, it's tough at DN. Where are we going? Both of your guys' picks make a lot of sense. Brendan Mott, in an an ideal world, he would be that guy. But he kind of goes into the category of some different defensive players we've seen over the past couple of years for me, like Khalid Duke, where, great, it's awesome to keep hearing about him. We see these little flashes, but can you go and be the dude for 12 games and really be impactful? And I just think Brendan Mott is what he is at this point. He's a, he's a great defensive end to have for K-State. But I just don't know that he's going to be able to have that upside that I'm looking for. Toby Austin saw me as this guy where you look at him and you go, he looks like a guy that can play Big 12 football at that position. And I think if he can reach what is there, he probably could be the most influential player. I, I reference this a lot, but going into the 2021 season at Media Day, Wyatt Thompson comes down and we're just sitting there kind of shooting the breeze or whatever. And he's like, Who's the who's the one guy on defense that you think needs to, you know, stand out this year to really take them to a, a you know, come through for him? And he and I both agree that it was Felix Andy DK at the time. And obviously Felix went on the next two years to go from nobody was talking or caring about him to being this really, really good player for K-State. And that's where I, I, you know, I'm not saying that that's that's not what Toby Austin saw me is going to be, but to me, that's one of those guys that if it gets unlocked and it clicks for him, he might have the most influential uh, time as a defensive end. And then number nine, I put Sam Hecht, another offensive lineman, because he seems to be in line to be the center right now. But that's probably the shakiest spot on the offensive line in terms of depth. And I think whatever comes out of that center job is going to have basically connections to every other part of the offensive line, where if Sam Heck struggles, you're probably looking at pulling other guys from elsewhere and plugging and playing dudes. And I think you this staff clearly wants Sam Heck to be the starting center this year. And they want that to be something that, okay, after game one, we never think about it again. But he's unproven, and he's going to have to come through and kind of show that he can earn it. So I think he's really, really important 
in terms of not only that one single position, but how it could impact the four other spots on the offensive line. And then Dylan Edwards is number 10 for me because he's going to get the ball in so many different ways, and it's going to be interesting to see how K-State uses him. And so I, I really think that that's probably one of those guys that if if things really click and they are able to put him in the right spots, he really can make a big difference for this team. Uh, and also, probably more important than anything to anybody is he's he's like the the Obi Wan Kenobi hope for this team to get back to actually being good on special teams and making that make a difference. So uh, that's that's probably why he's deserving of being on this list in my eyes. I not as much about the running side, although that is there. Like if something were to happen to DJ Giddens, you have a guy at running back that. May not be as consistent back there as a runner yet, but you certainly feel like he's going to be able to make plays for you back there like DJ can. And then you add in the fact that they're going to use him by throwing the ball to him and returning uh, kicks. So I, I think Dylan Edwards makes the list for that reason. So that is my logic there, and uh, we can start tearing people down. So we'll just start here. What, what do you guys like and not like about my 10? Uh, I like... I like the upside with Toby. Like that, that would be, he was the guy that I considered because of the upside too. And, and Sam Hecht is one that I didn't really think about putting as a, a in my top 10, but like it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I would say um, I, I like the Toby pick. And I thought about him as, as a candidate for my, uh, kind of breakout player with Scott, but I didn't, I went with Dylan, uh, I went with uh, Garrett Oakley, um, but Toby uh, has the potential to be, I'm just, you know, I think uh, maybe you were talking with Derek, um, how much is he going to play and what packages is he going to be in? Uh, is he just going to be a third down second and long guy? And does that limit it? Or is he going to be able to make the field on more plays uh in more possessions and be playing against the run. So I, I really like that. I like that you mentioned Garrett Oakley. It's, it's going to be curious to see, um, you know, I think part of it, the uh, will uh, Senate connection was part of why he was so good, but also, I mean, he's playing. I mean, the highlight from the commanders game yesterday was pretty impressive. So is that going to be a part? Does that change with Matt Wells? Um, I, I brought this up with Scott. Um, going back and looking through Matt Wells' staffs, he's always had an outside receiver coach and an inside slash tight end coach. Not like we've done it in the past where um, – and I, I thought about this when he mentioned um, um, uh, Dante Cephas as being only an outside guy. And I was like, that's curious because Colin kind of moved him around all over. But I think we're going to see more of that outside-inside split um, which doesn't change the role because because most of the time um, Senate was an inside slot guy, but he would line up outside sometimes. So I'm anxious to see how that Garrett Oakley fit works. And it, is he going to line up at fullback ever? Is he going to line up as an H back as much? And all those kinds of things that we kind of had the Swiss Army knife kind of position with with uh, Senate the last couple of years. Is that going to change under Matt Wells and will Oakley? be that kind of factor or will they, they go away from it? Yeah, no, I, I the Oakley thing is fascinating on how they're going to kind of use him and, and go with things. And I, I would say going back to, to Toby being on this list, like probably those last three guys are going to have to, because the first seven, they're going to be on the field and they're going to get numerous opportunities to be on the field. Like you're, you're not just going to be like, uh, things are, They've had a bad two, three games. We're taking them out. Like those guys will be on the field regardless. Eight, nine, and 10 on my list are guys that they will dictate themselves how much they play this year. And if at the end of the year, they're worthy of being on this list, you know, like if Sam Hecht is bad, they will find another option. They will try something different. If Toby can't do more for them, they're not going to put him out there enough for him to be worthy of being on this list. And Dylan Edwards is a little bit of a different situation. But I, I'm looking at him more as like a he's going to be on the field a lot right now, but could he take himself to where he's just like 
at almost every single offensive snap, unless the personnel calls for, hey, we're not even going to have, you know, one wide out out here or something, he will be on the field. Like he could put himself in that position to dictate, okay, you're not going to use one of these top three receivers as much as you thought you were going to, because you're going to put me out there instead. Um, so that he's a little different than, than Toby and Hecht, but uh, I would kind of view him in the same way. So I'll throw fans list back up there. Drew, what did you like or have a question about with what fan threw out? Yeah, uh, also like fans list, and I said it after fans list was up that you can't go wrong with any group of 10 unless it's somebody that like probably isn't going to play. <laughs> so having like guys like Austin Moore on there and DJ Giddens on there makes a lot of sense because you need them to kind of take that next level too. But the reason that they didn't make mine was that I felt pretty good about the guys behind them. But so I, I could go either way there. And then uh, I think the the other one uh, that I liked that I didn't have on my list was Hadley Panzer because I, I, I struggled to come up with offensive linemen and defensive end were the two positions that I really went back and forth on who I wanted on the list. Uh, but Hadley Panzer also makes a lot of sense because he's the older guy in the room that has a ton of experience and has played every year since he was a true freshman. So I think that that kind of experience is extremely valuable. So it would make sense if he's that guy that can also take that jump along the offensive line. Yeah. And I mean, Hadley Panzer to me, like is the guy that after, like we talked at big 12 media day, we, we know who all is going to be there. And so we're, you're kind of making mental notes of like, okay, how interested am I in talking to these people? And like, what do I think I get out of them? Hadley Panzer might've been, the the most fun that we had doing one and the most interesting interview down there. And so then you think how that might translate to how he can kind of help lead this offensive line and do some things there because outside of, you know, a handful of guys, like he's really the only true returning starter to this line where everybody else has kind of been part-time, but for the better part of two years now, Hadley Panzer has been out there for almost every snap, at least every important one. And I think you're seeing some of that growth. Uh, and obviously, he's got the talent to, to keep his, his spot where he's at. Uh, and and that, that's probably a good thing to point out the last two seasons for everybody on that offensive line, how good they had to be to be able to keep their jobs because there are a lot of guys coming in this year that have been waiting on the roster for it seems like two years now that we've been like, they've got the talent to overtake somebody if they're not willing to go out and perform. So I think Hadley Panzer is a really good one because that it makes sense that fan would put him on there because that to me is very much like his Austin Moore of the offensive mm -hmm. line type pick where it's, you know, that he's really good. He's going to be consistent and come through for you. And now there's a little bit more on his plate. Like he's going to be able to try and keep that group together and, and kind of calm a little bit more. So uh, yeah, Hadley Panzer. I like that one as well. Uh, all right, here is Drew's list. Fan, what uh, did you think of Drew's suggestion for most important Wildcats? I really like, um, you know, I, I like Drew, I struggled with the defensive end, and we all kind of picked someone different. Um, I, you know, I went, you know, I, you, we talked about it, I kind of went with experience, but I like both of your picks of, of Chidi and Toby is because I do think they're more – capable or more explosive type playmakers at that spot. And we're going to need that some, uh, I think Chidi's probably more likely to play more uh, often um, just because I think he has more of the size to, to handle, you know, playing against the run uh, in that spot. If we're, you know, when we're in an odd front. So I did like that Chidi pick. I think that's a really good one. Um, I like both of you picked Easton Kilty. I, I like your logic in that left tackle position is so important. He's a new guy. He's played a ton of football. Um, he's a football as football guy, uh, as, as coach likes to say. So it'll be interesting to see how he makes that transition. Um, and, and just the debate of, you know, Connor Riley pretty much penciled him as the guy and Kleiman was like, well, he's going to split time with, you know, and I'm like, or Pastore. And it's like, I think Kilty's going to be the guy. Like if Riley's saying he's going to be the guy, yeah. it's probably him. And Kleiman probably has other reasons for, for putting that out there and through the media. But I, I like that pick 
for both you guys just because I do think he's going to be a key. And him him making that transition to power four football and, and being a Big 12 uh, offensive line stalwart is is going to be a key for this offense. So I, I like that a lot. Yeah, it's it's it is. It, we joked about it this week about how uh, Kleiman was kind of like, yeah, you know, you got all of these guys kind of right here. And then Connor Riley was basically like, it's these five guys, and then there are two others that are right behind them. And then, uh, like, it seemed like he, you know, giant gap to everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Um, his issue, I think, is he wants an eight and nine guy that can yes. play, and they don't have him right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. That, uh, that will do it for us today. We will be back again. Hey, well, I got we'll one. Go ahead. Yeah. Who was, who was your biggest surprise that nobody picked? Mm. Cause I, I got, I, I'm saying VJ Payne that, He's a pretty yeah. good player, and none of us had him on the list. And I just think they're I think they're gonna be games. so good at safety. Yeah, no matter that's, like that's tough. Yeah. who you want to pick and how they're gonna like they've got so many guys there that that's what would make it difficult to get him on there. But he I mean, certainly deserving of a mention. It's maybe that's one too where like I think of him as being really good, but I need to see the potential to make the plays like Siegel that can be kind of game changing where Siegel, we, like I said, there's one very specific thing that we know he needs to do to become that game changer and it's catch the football. Yeah. Yeah. So it's true. You know, shout out to my the, guy. The, Stone the, hands. The, the thing that I kind of thought was fun about this is four different offensive linemen were mentioned. Mm-hmm. and three different defensive ends were mentioned and three different linebackers were mentioned. And I think that that's kind of the the three spots that I think that collectively, I think we all feel good about those spots, but we all try to like pick out our guys of like who we think is the most yeah. important. Yeah, no, for sure. All right, we will get out of here. We'll be back again next week, which will be uh, officially one week until the college football season actually gets started with week zero approaching. We are still two weeks away from the start of case or three weeks away from the start of K state season. We'll be two weeks there next week. So we'll do a little bit more next week to preview everything going on. And before we get out of here, I want to remind everybody that K state will be involved in week zero in 2025 so what better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on k-state and the Aer Lingus college football classic in dublin ireland the cats will square off with the iowa state cyclones on august 23rd 2025 whether it's a quick trip to dublin for the game a multi-city adventure throughout the irish countryside or exploring the emerald isle on your own there's a package for you Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com to make sure that you are overseas and watching K-State beat Iowa State next year in Farmageddon. So we will get out of here. We'll talk to you again next Sunday, the three of us. I'll be back throughout the week with Drew and DY with various things about the Cats. So for KSU underscore fan, Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO show and uh, make sure to head over to on three and check out kstateonline.com for everything else you need to know about the cat.